This week on the Green Left News podcast, 20 years since TJ Hickey was killed, governments failed to close the gap, and two years since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This podcast was recorded on stolen land, and Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellis and I'm excited to bring you the latest news this week, starting with the rally on February 17, marking 20 years since young Camilleroy man TJ Hickey was killed during a police pursuit when he was only 17 years old. So Auntie Gail Hickey, TJ's mother, and the Hickey family and supporters have been rallying every uh, February 17 for 20 years to mark the occasion where Redfern police chased TJ as he rode his push bike before they hit the bike and flung him onto a nearby fence where he was impaled. And every year since, the Hickey family have marched for justice for TJ. 20 years since a young, beautiful, young Aboriginal boy was innocently, and I repeat those words, innocently riding his push bike through his local neighbourhood when it came to the police's attention and they decided that there's a little black boy on the bike, he has to be committing a crime on the way to committing a crime or riding a stolen piece of property. So they took it upon themselves to pursue that young boy. And where we stand right now is a high, oh, it's emotional, like you know, a high place of relevance. Because those who don't know the story, we stand in front of the fence where young TJ ended up impaled and tragically lost his life, all due to the pursuit and chase of the Red Fern Police. Justice! What do we want? Now! Yeah, what do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! Yeah, what do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! Yeah, what do we want? Yeah, what do we want? Yeah, do we want? The Productivity Commission has found that the gap between First Nations people and the rest of the population has widened on four key social indicators. Rates of adult imprisonment, children in out-of-home care, suicide, and early childhood development. On several other indicators, including life expectancy, infant health, education, employment, and housing, the gap has gotten smaller, but not enough to meet targets agreed by federal, state, and local governments in the National Agreement on Closing the Gap 2020. A new progress report from the Commission, released in January, revealed that all levels of government have, for the most part, been weak and only tweaked or overlaid actions onto their business-as-usual approaches. The Invasion Day protests this year showed there's a strong mood for real change, rights and justice for First Nations people that governments have failed to address. There have been 20 straight weeks of Palestine rallies in some cities, with other cities not far behind, and that is what has led to Labour releasing its pathetic fake ceasefire call, which was contingent on the release of Israeli hostages. But thousands told Albanese that is not good enough and continued to rally, calling out the government for sending arms and military intelligence to Israel, as well as refusing to restore funding to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA. Israel has launched an invasion of Rafah, where more than a million people have fled to escape its genocidal bombardment of other parts of Gaza. And this has prompted more people to get out on the streets and protest against the genocide, including in Nam or Melbourne, where the most recent rally was the biggest so far this year. In Mianjin, Brisbane, rally chair Ramar Naji called out the government's description of Israel as a friend in its recent joint statement with New Zealand and Canada. And they said, people who commit genocide are not, are not our friends. In Gadigal or Sydney, activists have launched a 24-hour picket of Albanese's electorate office in Marrickville. The picket started on February 11 and is still going strong, even with the heavy rain and storms in the past few days. And they've committed to a permanent vigil and sit-in until there is an immediate and permanent ceasefire. The UNRWA funding is reinstated and Labor ends its support for the State of Israel. The protest is also calling for support for the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign against Israel and for support for Palestinian families in Gaza who wish to leave. 
And the picket was launched by Families for Palestine and is being supported by a range of groups. Um, to get involved, you can go down and join the picket at 334A Marrickville Road or email familiesforpalestine at gmail.com to put your name down on the roster. Another inspiring action took place in Bathurst at Lamont Radjuri Park on February 11, where Central West New South Wales for Palestine organised a kite flying event for children and families. Organiser Kate Demare reported that on July 29, 2011, the children of Gaza launched 15,000 kites, breaking the world record during their campaign to lift the siege on the Gaza Strip. And she said it was an important uh, for regional, regional areas to take action for Palestine, despite the tyranny of distance. Palestinian activist Khalid Ghanem spoke about the desperate need to end the genocide and save the children of Gaza. Things like here in the countryside, playing with the kids safely, flying your kites up, is something normal here. But we cannot do it back home in Gaza. In Palestine, kids are scared going out. They hear bombs 24 hours per day, like they cannot have normal life. And we, we, when we gather here, we want you to remember that we, we hope one day you come to Palestine and let your kids play with our kids there. Lots of people remember the message of peace and rebellion in the music of Bob Marley, with Get Up, Stand Up encouraging us to stand up for our rights and not give up the fight. This became an anthem for young people struggling for a better world. Mali spoke out against apartheid in South Africa and called for a united uh, Africa to resist European colonialism. But now his son Ziggy Mali, who is performing at Woe Madelaide in March, is a Zionist. And Ziggy has recently raised funds for the Israeli Defense Forces and signed onto a letter condemning Hamas with hundreds of celebrities. And several organizations have called on the Woe Madelaide Foundation, uh, a registered charity to help migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers to cancel Mali's performance, but they haven't had any success. The Australian Friends of Palestine Association is asking people to turn their backs on Mali's performance to highlight the dissonance between his sweet words and his actions. Stand up for your right. And a progressive ticket is contesting the Cairns Regional Council local government elections and for mayor on March 16. Community First wants to make the council more democratic and open, with mayoral candidate Dennis Walls saying the team is campaigning on big ideas, big concepts and big solutions. He said the team want to hold community forums and involve the community in more decision making. Community First are putting forward progressive solutions to housing affordability, climate action and expanding public transport, as well as countering the scare campaign about youth crime. If you want to help the campaign, click the link in the podcast description. School cleaners in New South Wales are campaigning for Premier Chris Minns to fix the failed privatised cleaning model. Their video statements released on February 9 gave details of their extreme workloads and dangerous workplaces as well as low pay. The United Workers Union released a damning report the same day which reveals that private operators are making millions in profits. New South Wales school cleaners are demanding that the failed privatisation model is ended and, that, and have said that the cleaning model in public schools and buildings is fundamentally broken. Also in New South Wales, the long-awaited report by the Special Commission of Inquiry into LGBTIQ hate crimes, which was released in December, made 19 recommendations, including fresh inquiries into the deaths of several men. The inquiry found that New South Wales police response to victims and their families was completely inadequate. It said the police were indifferent, negligent, dismissive and hostile in many cases. It gave details of the police's failure to maintain evidence from past LGBTIQ hate-motivated crimes and its inability to complete investigative files. Meanwhile, the Minns government is attempting to water down a bill to ban gay conversion therapy under pressure from the newly formed Faith Affairs Council. And conversion therapy consists of a range of techniques to change or suppress a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. 
an independent MP, Alex Greenwich, had introduced the Conversion Practices Prohibition Bill to ban conversion therapy practices in August last year, pointing out the harm and trauma induced by the treatment. The Faith Affairs Council is attempting to exempt religious counselling from the ban, with one council member claiming to have secured a commitment from Attorney General Michael Daly that religious counselling would be excluded. If that's the case, then MINS is allowing a harmful and debunked activity to continue to appease the conservative religious right. Also in New South Wales, the local government minister, Ron Honig, has introduced a bill that claims to help councils that were forcibly amalgamated to demerge, but in reality, it does the opposite, removing the only clause in the current law which mandates state funding for a demerger. Honig's local government amendment, De Amalgamations Bill 2024, tabled on February 6, removes the government's liability to help councils demerge and stops councils from holding polls on deamalgamation unless approved by the Minister. Daria Turley, who's the local government association of New South Wales president and Broken Hill Labour councillor, described the bill as a cunning sleight of hand, and Granley Ingram from the Demerged New South Wales Alliance described it as an attack on democracy. Now, public housing tenants are leading the push to stop New South Wales Labour from demolishing public housing in the inner city in the worst housing crisis in living memory. At least 57,000 households are on the New South Wales public housing wait list, and despite promising to stop privatisation, MINS is planning to evict thousands of tenants from their homes by demolishing the estates in Glebe, Waterloo South and South Everly, and selling the land to developers. Mascot public housing is also under threat. The MINS government has already demolished the public housing estate in Arncliffe, and Telepia's three sister towers lie empty. Now you can join the campaign to save public housing in New South Wales by following Action for Public Housing on Facebook. You can also check out the interview I did with Kristen O'Connell from the Anti-Poverty Centre, uh, which is on the podcast feed or on the Green Left website. We talk about solutions to homelessness, including governments building and buying public housing. The government should spend $300 billion on public housing and increasing Centrelink payments and not on tax cuts. Every person living on a low income, whether they're employed or unemployed, would benefit more from that type of investment than having thousands of dollars go to the wealthiest people uh, on the continent. Community organisations and unions demonstrated their support for the Hunter Offshore Wind Farm Wind Power Project on February 4, with more than 800 people turning out to the Hunter Workers' Action. Another pro-offshore wind rally was organised in the Illawarra region on the same day. The Hunter Wind Farm Project came about after a blue-collar union-led campaign supported by the Hunter Jobs Alliance and Rising Tide, and last year it won federal support for a 5 gigawatt offshore wind zone, which can power 6.6 million homes. Steve Murphy, who's the Australian Metal Workers Union New South Wales Secretary, uh, acknowledged in a rousing speech all the comrades in the union movement and all those activists in the environmental movement that have come here today to stand together. Murphy warned against the rights false jobs versus the environment pitch and said every single day workers get exploited and the environment gets exploited for private profit. We know who our enemy is. It is private capital. Strengthening the links between workers and climate campaigners is essential to assure a just transition towards renewable energy. Now let's hear what's happening around the world. February 24 marks two years since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Green Left spoke to Victoria Pihul from the Ukrainian Democratic Socialist Organization Social Movement about what the impact of the war has been. She said it has normalized war and has become part of everyday life. And this has meant that other issues such as corruption, inequality and economic problems have, be- have come back on the agenda. However, she said, most discussions are still conducted through the prism of war and opposition to Russia. 
She explained that Ukrainian society is not as united as it was at the start of the invasion, as different social groups have had to compromise their interests to varying degrees to win the war. She also said the Zelensky government has not been able to carry out a new large-scale mobilization because of the financial costs and the political cost of raising taxes to pay for it. On another note, Peel said that the invasion has led to a more pro-Palestinian position in society, as Ukrainians can more easily relate to the Palestinians resisting Israeli attackers. However, the Zelensky government is not supporting Palestine, even though it has supported the pro-Palestine resolutions at the United Nations. You can read the abridged version of the interview on the Green Left website and the full version at links.org.au. A Russian military court has ruled that socialist and anti-war dissident Boris Kagalitsky has spent five years in jail, overturning his original sentence, which was a fine. And the February 13 ruling also means he cannot continue his role as editor of the online leftist media platform Rabcor, or workers' correspondent. Kagalitsky is one of the few high-profile opponents of Putin's war to remain in Russia and is being targeted for this, being labelled a foreign agent back in May 2022. He was charged for justifying terrorism over comments made in a since-deleted YouTube video regarding the bombing of the Crimea Bridge, and Amnesty International's director for Russia has said the verdict is a blatant abuse of vague anti-terrorism legislation weaponized to suppress dissent and punish a government critic. She said that by targeting Boris Kagalitsky, a distinguished sociologist known for his critical stance against government policies, the Russian authorities are showing once again their relentless assault on all forms of dissent. Some good news on February 12, as human rights organizations won a lawsuit forcing the Dutch government to stop sending arms to Israel that are being used in the war in Gaza. The court ordered the Dutch government stop supplying F-35 jet fighter parts to Israel within seven days due to the clear risk of serious violations of international humanitarian law. The judge concluded, based on reports from Amnesty and the United Nations, that many civilians, including children, are being targeted. And Oxfam Novib, one of the groups who brought the case, uh, the director, Michel Surveyor, said the ruling is very good news. He said Israel has just launched an attack against the city of Rafa, where more than half of Gaza's population are sheltering. The Netherlands must take immediate steps, and we hope that this verdict can encourage other countries to follow suit. In an exclusive interview with Green Left, Salah Muslim, the co-chair of the Democratic Union Party, which is the leading party of the Rojava revolution in northeast Syria, warned that the escalation of conflict in the Middle East could be the beginning of a third world war. He said that Turkey has taken advantage of the conflict in Gaza to step up its attacks on Rojava, with the declared aim of destroying our infrastructure and making our lives difficult. He said all of these powers are pursuing their own interests. Some are after the energy resources such as gas and petroleum, and others want the other sources of wealth in the region. He said nobody can guess what is going to happen next because there are so many powers with their own agendas in the region. And Pakistan's February 8 general election resulted in a split vote with no party securing a clear majority. The vote was divided among various right-wing parties indicating a significant shift in political dynamics. Initial results suggest Pakistan which has voted against IMF policies, which, has led, which had led to uh, unprecedented price hikes, and also voted against state repression. The elections were delayed unconstitutionally for several months by the caretaker government that assumed power in August 2023, and they were evidently orchestrated to favour the Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz. The left wing suffered due to the popularity of the Pakistan Tariq Insaf, or the, which is the party of Imran Khan, who had been the target of several politically motivated convictions in the lead up to the elections. Most of the anti-military establishment and anti-IMF policy votes went to the PTI. The elections were marred by widespread corruption with all major political parties spending huge sums to buy votes and the outcome underscores the dominance of right-wing ideologies in Pakistan. Now, I've got some really good interviews online at greenleft.org.au. 
including one with Sri Lanka's People's Liberation Front Educational Secretary and Central Committee member, Padubu Jayagoda, which is about building the people's movement in Sri Lanka. There's also one with Argentine Marxist economist Claudio Katz, discussing the election of Javier Millet and resistance to his regime. And also with Mariana Riscali, who's a leader of the socialist left movement tendency inside Brazil's radical left socialism and freedom party, or PESOL, uh, discussing the nature of the new workers' party government led by President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. So you can read all those interviews and all of the, more about all of the stories we've talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider becoming a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our fighting fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate, and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out, and your support is greatly appreciated. As always, you can head to the activist calendar at greenleft.org.au slash events to find out about upcoming protests, rallies, forums, cultural events, and more that are happening in your town and city. And the big event that's coming up in the, to the end of June is Eco-Socialism 2024. Uh, we've got some exciting speakers to announce here on the podcast. Um, so the, the Eco-Socialism Conference will be taking place in Borlu or Perth from June 28 to 30. And we've already got a great lineups, starting with uh, Leila Khalid, who's the legendary Palestinian resistance leader from the People's Front for the Liberation of Palestine's National Committee, who will be joining via video link. Amar Ali Jan, who's a Pakistani activist, historian, youth leader, and president of the Hakuk Ekalk Party, as well as Salim Vali, who's a South African human rights activist and director of the Center for Education Rights and Transformation at the University of Johannesburg. So those three are going to be incredible to hear from, and there's also going to be a whole bunch more uh, incredible speakers uh, that we will announce over the coming months. Um, so head to ecosocialism.org.au to stay up to date on uh, what's happening with the conference, the upcoming, the different sessions and panels and workshops that will be announced, and also obviously the great list of speakers. Um, so thanks for listening, and thanks to Sean Valenzuela for the music in this podcast. And you can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats or clicking on the link in the description. And remember to follow at Green Left Online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.